So in this lecture, we're going to dig a little bit into the cryptanalysis of hash functions, but only the generic attacks. So we're not going to go through all the details of why certain hash functions are weak. It's actually fascinating to look, and also our Eindhoven University has been uh, quite visible in this, particularly in the MD5 um, attacks. So Mark Stevens, who is now at CWI, together with my colleague Ben de Vera, has been doing a lot of work on really showing that MD5 it should be dead and no longer be used. Uh, they were doing a lot of the attacks there. Um, however, here we're looking at the generic hardness and generic attacks. And this is just quoting a small piece from the last slide, uh, saying that if you're looking for provisions, then the generic attacks are using the worst paradox. Okay, well, whenever you see something like worst paradox and provision search, you should start thinking about, do I really have to do a lot of storage, or can I use my knowledge of forward rooms? For its cycle finding method, say, in order to make a well, basically storage free version of the circuit. And so, if you want to use the row method, then just like in the uh, slide that I had explaining the row method in general, there are two steps. So, you need to have the function so that it well, samples randomly. I mean, of course, it's randomly with quotation marks because it's pseudo randomly because it uh, needs to have the same walk so that they can reach the same distinguished point that they can use the Floyd cycle finding method. But we want to have a random sampling from this input space so that we can apply the worst paradox. If it's a too restricted or structured space, then that wouldn't work. And then the second part is that we want to design the function so that a collision gives a meaningful result. And at first you might think that, hey, wait a second. Well, for, collision, uh, for hash functions, collisions is exactly what I want. Um, we'll go through this on the next slide, and that means we actually have to think about this a little bit more. But let me first get to the first step, namely how to design the function. Now, what I've been showing you as a hash function, taking arbitrary long strings and having to fix length strings, then the uh, output space is just a subset of the message space. So you can actually simply iterate. So your um, pseudo random walk can simply be you take some random starting point w0, and then the iteration is just another application of the hash function. And I'm going to explain most of what I'm doing here in terms of that function because it's a very common case. But sometimes you have other requirements. Say instead of having arbitrary strings, you're only accepting group elements. For instance, if you have a key exchange, you know what goes into the key derivation function is the object of the shape a times b times p, so it's a multiple of p, and so maybe you would only accept multiples of p as inputs rather than arbitrary strings. And so then you need to have some way to map back from the hash output to the message space. So then you would need uh, an extra map that's called psi, uh, phi which goes from h to m. So assume that the hash function goes from m to h, message space m, hash space h, then you would need to have a composition with this map phi in order to get the iteration function. And so that each step has one application of phi, one application of h. Now the collisions are only in the h part, so these are between the phi of wi and phi of wj. Whenever you have come up with a, well, random walk row method where you can do something usable, useful, we can also think about how to parallelize it. So then you have the fun all wiener attack that we have seen in the discrete log attack. And similarly here, when, once we get it off the ground, we now have an iteration function, you can also parallelize it. Okay, so part two, that it means it gives a meaningful result. Okay, so how do we use collisions? So here on the left we have this picture that I showed you for Floyd cycle finding algorithms. So we have the tail of the function, and then we start walking around in the cycle. And then by Floyd I explained, well, we find at some point we have the, the slow walk and the fast walk going around, and at some point both at the same index meet at the same point, say the meet here. Or with the distinguished points for the parallel version of Floyd's rule. We had the blue walk at some point start here, go along, and reach this distinguished point. For hash functions, distinguished points would be just similar to the fine tool to uh, yeah, hold row on 
put the curved discrete logs a little bit more natural even here because it's just bit strings. So you would also see the distinguished point has a certain fixed number of zeros in the top part of the bit string. And then, well, sometime later, the orange ball comes along and happens to merge here and goes on. And then for the, um, when we went through the details of how you recover the discrete log, we assume that we're coming there with two different uh, combinations that once we get here, and that also has worked in all the examples that you computed, once we find ourselves merging here or merging with this distinguished point, um, we can actually look at how we got there. But in the context of hash function, that's not meaningful. Because if I look at, well, how did I get here? How is this a collision? They were the same before. Or here, we now have this point as a collision, but it's not a collision. It's just a unique hash output from a unique hash input. The collision happened here or happened there. Well, then you feel like you could maybe backtrack. But hash function is made so that you can't backtrack. You're trying to violate pretty much resistance, and that should be really hard. You're trying to break collision resistance, and if that ends up being uh, requiring break collision, uh, pretty much resistance, you would be doing something far forwards. So we want to get these two points, either to that one, or we want to get this point and that point, which merged here. Now, what we can do, and let me let me now focus on the right picture here on the parallel version, is that when we report a distinguished point, we actually send a triple of data. We're not just sending the distinguished point we got, um, but then among the information how we got there, we send what the entry point was. So we're sending what the starting point was, this one and that one. So we're sending our W0 here and the W0 prime for this one. And now in order to be able to backtrack, well, it's going to be forward tracking, um, in order to find the collision, we will actually recompute it and we will also need the length. Now assume that we have reached the same point and that the orange walk has length L and the blue walk has length L prime. And L prime happens to be larger than L. Well, I can compare them. If they're equal length, it's also fine. And else I swap the arguments out. Then, if I want to figure out where they merged, then the blue walk took longer time to get there. So if I want to have a collision at the same time, then the blue walk has to go a few steps earlier. So I'm giving the blue walk a head start exactly by the difference of L prime minus L. I'm doing that many steps. And then from that point on, I know both have walked equally many steps to get to the distinguished point. And at some point, they must have merged. So I'm sort of backtracking. I know that, well, I'm interested in something which is L steps back, which for the orange walk, because L is small, smaller, is the whole thing from the starting point. And for the blue walk, which is a bit longer, is most of the walk starting just about here. And then we start computing, well, let's call this W double prime, which is h applied this difference between the l's many times to the same thing. And now both of these have to walk l steps in order to get to the distinguished point. Now there's a corner case. If the collision happened where this was one of the entry points and the other entry point is exactly the, the, uh, on path. So the instead of being the blue path somewhere away, it was actually on path. Then we notice that we are unlucky, namely that the W double prime is the same as the other W. Then we don't get the collision. But everything else, so if there's still at least some steps left from those walks, then we have something before collision happens. And so now for every step, we're gonna remember where we are currently. We're gonna do one step forward, if this step happens to be the same, so the collision happens now, then you grab the last different, so this sub O, the old point. We're keeping them. The next step, we move forward. If these are the same, we output those, and else, well, from the next ones, we put those on O, and then we move forward. Eventually, I mean, we know that the distinguished point was the same, so eventually those two must merge. So we know that in at most L steps, we're going to get this collision. 
And then there's a whole lot of more things to consider. So when we went into the biscuit log attack uh, using Polaro, I was talking about how to optimize it, taking into account um, the bandwidth, storage, and so on. So here, since you must recompute at the end, you will also need to do two more walks. So once you know you actually in principle have a collision, unless you're super unlucky, um, you will also have to do two T more steps here. And similarly, also in this case, well, you would remember how often you have walked around or how many steps you've done um, and then retrack your steps. You would have to do it again. Um, so both of those require some fine tuning, but we have now seen the main idea. So you can also, for hash function collisions, remember that you can do it in a basically memory free, so storage free. Now this is um, dealing with the issue that we wouldn't even have a collision because, well, I mean, it's not a collision one step earlier. It's a collision several steps earlier. But typically we want to have a meaningful collision. So we want to have something which you can actually show to somebody who is not a cryptographer and say, hey, isn't it weird that this picture would override your nice moon picture? Here is a picture of my kitten and it has the same hash as your picture of the moon which you really liked. Well, guess what? Hey! How about you save my kitten picture? And I get this on your page and suddenly the computer gets very confused because it thinks these two are the same. I don't know how to make kitten pictures and moon pictures do this. Uh, PDF files are very, very flexible. And PDF files can include kitten and moon pictures. So yes, there are some places where you have, say, um, invisible images or macros. So you have a lot of place to play with. Now the hash functions typically still maps just to a bit string, so the um, hash output space is h from that first slide, that would still be the, say, 256 bit strings. But the input space would now be restricted to just being valid PDF files. And so then the um, hash output is not a subset of m, so we do need this function phi in order to move around. And we want to have that all the inputs are valid, so we tell you starting with some valid w0. And then we figure out some positions in the PDF file, say this invisible image part, where we can modify things without uh, changing the perception of, of the reader of the file. So whether it shows the kitten picture or the moon picture, it actually has some other stuff at the bottom that nobody can see. And that's where all your variations take place. And you use those bits in order to have injective map from H to M. Because you definitely want this to be injective. You don't want two different hash outputs mapped to the same hash input because that would look like, look like a collision, except for it's a collision at phi rather than a collision in H. Now, if you go ahead with this, um, so soon after the first uh, MV5 collisions coming out, there were some papers investigating like different file formats, uh, PS files, more popular than my PDF files providing. And then in 2007, the Eindhoven group again, uh, Mark Stevens, was uh, giving a kind of very meaningful condition. And what they said was, okay, they can predict the winner of the US presidential election. So one year in advance, they knew already uh, who would be the winner. And they posted a hash string and said, okay, um, after the election, we will show you that we had it right all along. We will post a PDF file which says, well, we are the people, today we predict that, well, Barack Obama, Barack Obama won, so we predict that Barack Obama is the winner. Okay, they're scientists, so they actually talk too much, and so they had a whole page with nice explanations, including this picture here on the right, um, namely, they're looking into something which is even more powerful than a collision, namely a chosen prefix collision. So a chosen prefix collision means you have two pieces which are different and you can pick those. One being Obama will win and two being uh, Hillary Clinton will win. Okay, that was on the 2008 uh, election, but you get the, the, they had Paris Hilton as one of those. So it's, it's, it's a fun page to look. Also, I mean, for you, 2008 is very, very long ago. Even for me, it feels a while ago. Um, and then 
the collisions that exist on MD5 and that they could find are so powerful that they could take 12 different candidates and get AB to collide, CD to collide, and then the way that MD5 is built is such that once you have a collision somewhere, they continue forever. So these will never separate. But then they have more flexibility, so it could also make the AB, the AB and the CD collide, so you get a multiple collision here, multiple collision there, have those collide. In the end, all 12 map to the same hash string. And so uh, they're using some flexibility in the PF standard, but they're also using that MD5 is a very, very weak hash function. So uh, in that picture, you can see how far. Uh, you can see the essence of multiple collisions. Uh, the URL that is given there is a very nice kind of popular science web page that I highly encourage you to read. And it's also been to a paper where they explain what they need to do in order to get these multiple collisions. Now that goes into the uh, dirty details of how the, how the function works, but it gives you a good understanding of how much bit fiddling is, uh, is involved with these functions, but also some of the theory, because uh, most of these functions are built in an iterative manner, which then of course explains that once you have two pieces collide, that they will continue together, because, well, if it's iterating, and it has the same input to the iteration function, also the next step, the next step, and so on, the same. But at every step, you're still compressing, and so you have further chances of doing what we see here, the AB and the CD uh, getting together, and so on. So uh, current hash functions, so SHA-1 has been broken afterwards. There is now one paper which is also getting into chosen privileged collisions, and we don't have anything like this for SHA-256 SHA uh, or the SHA-3 family. So the more modern hash functions are good from all we know, and the older ones, MD5 or SHA-1, really shouldn't be used for anything. We're cryptographic security.